Coming up on the machine that changed the world, two California kids lead the PC revolution. I was not designing a computer with any idea we'd ever start a company, ever have a product, ever be successful. But Apple Computer became the fastest growing company in history. Now smaller, faster, and cheaper, some people loved computers. Some hated them. The paperback computer, next on the machine that changed the world. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation. The scribes of the Middle Ages who practiced the art of writing pioneered a medium which would become the very foundation of civilization. Yet for many centuries, access to the written word was confined to the few. Books were priceless, guarded by an attendant priesthood. A single volume had the value of a farm. Even after printing was introduced, Books remained large and expensive. It seemed unlikely that they would ever become available to a wider public. The latest technology that came in at the end of the 16th century was the idea of the chained library, uh, whereby books could be instantly accessible to anybody who visited the library, and uh, by simply extracting a book with the, the chain just long enough for the book to be lowered from the case onto the desk in front of the reader, and there the person could study the book as much as they wanted with no fear of them being able to remove it. For books to become generally available, they had to lose their chains and become smaller and more affordable. Today, books are everywhere, written in hundreds of languages about thousands of subjects. Once the exclusive property of a small educated class, they have become the foundation of modern culture. In the past few years, a competitor to the book has begun rooting itself in the culture of the young, the computer. But when the ancestors of the modern computer first appeared some 45 years ago, they too were fabulously expensive and controlled by a mathematical priesthood. The idea that computers would be commonplace seemed ludicrous, just as ludicrous as the idea that illuminated manuscripts could lead to the paperback book. Even mathematicians found computers very difficult to use. They had to prepare their programs in the arcane language of the computer, punch them onto tape or cards, and bring them to a computer center to be run. And it rarely worked the first time. Hey, what's going on here? Something must be wrong with the oscilloscope. There was a, a skill set that you needed to have to be a really good programmer. You had to be very careful and meticulous and disciplined, because if you made even the smallest errors in syntax, if you misplaced a period or omitted uh, you know, a, a parenthesis, your entire uh, program wouldn't run, and it would take hours. I just didn't have that kind of skill or, or, or patience, and so I found programming on the old big machines to be unbelievably frustrating, and I used to get really angry about it because I couldn't understand why the things weren't easier to use. I think it was bleak, a uh, human being having to punch holes in lots of cards and keep these cards all straight and then take this deck of what might be hundreds and hundreds of cards uh, to uh, a computer and you go away and you come back the next day 
and find out that your program executed up until card uh, 433 and then it stopped because you left out a comma. So you take your deck of cards and you go back and you fix that and you go back to the computer again and this time it, the program got to card 4006 and it stopped because you forgot to punch a O instead of a zero or some other stupid reason. I think it was bleak. I think it was dehumanizing. This Stanford student film parodied the tyranny of early programming. Unable to get his job done, this frustrated student decides to end it all. If programmers were driven to suicide by computers, what chance was there for ordinary people ever using them? Yet within a few decades, the image of the computer would be transformed. Like the book, it would get smaller, cheaper, and become so easy to use that millions would become literate in the new medium. We're going to show you a man actually talking to a computer in a way far different than it's ever been possible to do before. Surely not with his voice. No, he's going to be talking graphically. He's going to be drawing and the computer is going to understand his drawings. And the man will be using a language, a graphical language that we call Sketchpad, that started with Ivan Sutherland some years ago when he was busy working on his doctoral degree. In an era when almost everybody thought computers were only for crunching numbers, a young graduate student, Ivan Sutherland, used clever software to make the computer manipulate engineering drawings. With Sketchpad, Sutherland created the field of computer graphics and 30 years ago demonstrated the power of a whole new way of talking to the computer, interactive computing. But would anybody listen? We were off to a fabulous start in 1960 with uh, Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad one of the most extraordinary programs ever written. And the amazing thing to me is that this, this did not start a vast movement. In fact, it just stood there as an example that people would gaze at. They'd look at the movie and say, yeah, gee, well, that's very inspirational. And then they'd go back and do exactly what they were doing, which had nothing to do with interactive computing, because there wasn't any interactive computing. If every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. A few years later, Another visionary, Doug Engelbart, appealed to his colleagues to change the way they thought about computers. In a spectacular demonstration, he showed off a series of brilliant innovations, including a pointing device called a mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. Decades ahead of his time, Engelbart had given a glimpse of what was to come. Doug Engelbart is the single most important person in the history of computing. And it's shocking how few people have actually heard of him. It would be as if we all use electricity and light bulbs, but nobody had heard of Thomas Edison. 25 years later, Doug Engelbart walks unrecognized on the Stanford campus. His bold gamble didn't pay off. We just thought, boy, then within a year or two, there'll be all sorts of people joining this pursuit and it, it become more of an acceptable <laughs> activity. And, you know, it seemed, to, and what I hear from various places is that it's stimulated and motivated some people, but it didn't seem to connect us to something that was a viable strand of pursuit for people to pick up, and it just didn't. Impressive though his demonstration was, the computer establishment didn't think his vision was practical. Because the establishment never gets it. That's how it is with paradigm shift. The establishment does not see where the next wave is coming from. And even if they hire somebody to tell them where the next wave is coming from, they never believe them, which is exactly what happened with Xerox and Xerox Park. One of the implications of Engelbart's demonstration was the possibility of paperless communication, and that did not go unnoticed in one quarter. Thank you, Debbie. That was fast. Which is the original? I forget it. 
The Xerox Corporation owed its prosperity to paper copying. If one day paper was to be outdated, then they wanted to be part of the new electronic world. So in a visionary act, they set up a research center at Palo Alto in California, Xerox Park, and agreed to fund it for 10 years. They gathered together many bright young computer scientists and challenged them to make computers easy to use. Feeling that computers would eventually change the office environment, Xerox wanted to investigate how non-technical people might one day use computers. The reason that most of us went to work there was that uh, we felt that this would be a, an opportunity to bring computing to everyone. Remember, a computer at that time was thought of as something that was very forbidding, difficult, highly technological, you had to be a real expert and uh, uh, a doctorate to understand. You know, that was kind of the public image. And we somehow had to humanize computers and make them a common object that anyone could use. In the years ahead, this disheveled group of young scientists would seek to create a different way of interacting with a computer. They knew they couldn't do it alone. They had far too much technical knowledge to understand the problems of the ordinary user, but they had a brilliant insight. Why not try to see the problem from the standpoint of children? Technical people uh, live in this tiny little world, actually. We like to think it's a big world, but it's actually a tiny little world. And it's full of uh, phrases that we learned when we were taking math classes. And uh, it's, it's hermetic. And uh, it's full of people who like to learn complicated things. They delight in it. And so what you need to have is some way of constantly shocking yourself into realizing that the users are not like us. And children do it really well, because they don't care about the same kinds of things that adults do, and they can always go out and play ball. They, don't, they haven't learned to feel guilty about not working yet. And it forced us to start thinking about how uh, human mentalities might work. The key to making computers easy to use lay in the way children learned. By observing children growing up, psychologists have seen that at different stages, children perceive the world in quite different ways. Very young children explore the world through touch, reaching and grabbing the objects in their world. For children of five or six, the visual mentality is more important. The Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget had shown just how strong it is in a series of classic experiments. Well, Dr. Inhelder here is filling one glass with milk, then she's asking the child to fill his with exactly the same amount as she has in hers. For children like this five-year-old, the visual mentality is so dominant they may be led into error. In this classic experiment, the child has to decide whether two glasses have the same amount of milk in them. After the child is happy that the two glasses contain equal amounts, the investigator makes her move. I would prefer to drink my milk in the tall glass. I have poured it all in the tall glass. You and I, have we still the same amount? No. Who has more? In this glass? But how do you know? Because it is taller. At the time, we would just Later on, we learn with difficulty to handle symbolic reasoning. Because many people find things like algebra difficult, it is not surprising they also find computers impossible to use. Anne's age, therefore, would be 18 years old. But the intuitive mentalities of touch and vision stay with us all our lives. We are all expert at seeing something, reaching out and grabbing it. The Xerox scientists realized this was the key to making computers easy to use. By programming the computer to control the elements of a television screen, they created an illusion of a paper-like surface on which pictures could be drawn and animated.
Doug Engelbart's mouse, which fit comfortably into the hand, was the perfect kinesthetic device. With it, one could reach out and grab objects on the screen and move them around. Sophisticated software enabled the unfriendly computer to simulate a world the user already understood. This paint program from 1972 made the act of painting on a computer remarkably similar to painting in the real world. Other software enabled letters to be formed or music to be written and transcribed. Software could change the computer from a forbidding machine into a friendly mental tool. What we realized was that we could create what some people called a user illusion, uh, something that appeared to be a world on a screen. One way to think about it is if you play a video game, there's an illusion of spaceships or of uh, roads and cars or depending on the kind of game. And uh, the user who gets engrossed in the game uh, starts operating as if they're really working in the real world when, when in fact they're only working in this imaginary simulated world created by the sequence of steps in the computer program. So what we realized was that we could create an illusion, for example, of an office with uh, folders and documents and file cabinets in the office and that instead of having the user learn complicated and unfamiliar technological terms we could use the metaphor of the office for example and talk about opening files and uh, closing files and editing documents and other terms that were much more familiar to people consider what can occur in just one window the paperless letter edited and error-free, disseminated to any station in the network. By the early 70s, Xerox scientists with their Alto office system had demonstrated the future. Even let you know it has been received. And when hard but at $45,000 each, few users could afford it. This was one reason why Xerox decided not to market it, and why today no one has heard of the Alto computer. The reason no one's heard of it is because it wasn't made into a successful product. Uh, now, are you asking why wasn't it made into a successful product? The short answer is that uh, that, that research was done uh, in the context of a copier company, not a computer company. And when it came down to it, this copier company was not ready to launch headlong into the personal computer revolution. By itself, the brilliant work of Xerox PARC wasn't enough to change the world of computing. Before computers would become commonplace, they had to become smaller and cheaper. A few miles from Xerox PARC in Silicon Valley, the electronics capital of the world, a revolution was underway. Every year, engineers vied with each other to stuff more and more electronic circuitry onto tiny wafers of silicon. Computers which once filled a room had been reduced to the size of a refrigerator. And in 1971, the silicon wizards went a step further, putting the main circuitry of a computer on a chip. A chip which could be mass produced. The microprocessor had the power to totally change the economics of computing. Computers need no longer be priceless objects microprocessors, if mass-produced, could become cheap enough to be disposable. I had one uh, case where I was being interviewed by somebody from uh, a magazine who kept asking questions about testing. But I realized after this questioning went on for a while that they weren't really talking about testing, they were talking about repair. And they had the idea that somehow somebody was have to, going to have to take their soldering iron and go down inside the chip and try to move wires around. And then uh, once I realized what they were really asking, I said, oh, no, it's not like that at all. It's like a light bulb. When it burns out, you unplug it and you throw it in the garbage and plug in a new one. And they were just dumbfounded at the idea that a computer could be so inexpensive you'd think about throwing it away. But in the mid-70s, corporate giants like IBM were not convinced that ordinary people would ever want to buy computers, even if they were small and cheap. Seemingly unaware of the brilliant work of Xerox PARC, 
They saw their customers as scientific and business institutions. There was a group of technical people on the fringes of the computer establishment, however, who desperately wanted their own computers. Technical hobbyists who had used computers at universities and knew their remarkable versatility. Before the microprocessor, their dreams seemed absurd. Now, perhaps, things would change. In January 1975, the front cover of Popular Electronics featured a computer kit called the Altair for less than $500. The Altair had to be assembled by hand, but at its heart was a microprocessor. If people did want to own a computer, here, finally, was an opportunity. An opportunity, it turned out, that thousands of people had been waiting for. And what happened was all this pent-up demand, a sort of latent understanding everybody had of what computers could do, suddenly was allowed to burst forth. People drove all night to get their computer kits. Why do people read the popular mechanics magazines? Because they dream of all the things they could do if. And suddenly here was a new if. If only I had this computer, I could keep track of everything. I could learn everything. I could be creative in every possible way. And, um, and so it began. For technical hobbyists, it was a dream come true. Now they could have their own computer. Clubs of enthusiasts grew up all over America, like the Homebrew Computer Club in San Francisco, where members showed off what their homebrewed computers could do. From these modest beginnings came a series of startup companies selling parts for the Altair, and soon, whole computers. By 1976, there were enough of them to hold a convention in Atlantic City. Off in a corner of the convention hall were a group of raggedy-looking guys selling circuit boards. Two of them would become synonymous with a personal computer, Steve Jobs and Steven Wozniak. As teenagers growing up in Silicon Valley, Jobs and Wozniak had developed reputations as high-tech pranksters, all too eager to snub their noses at authority. Woz and I had known each other since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And our first project together was we built these little blue boxes to uh, make free telephone calls. And we had the best blue box in the world. It was this all digital little blue box. I don't think it works anymore, so. Uh, but uh, we, had a, we had a fun time doing that. So when it came to building a computer together, Woz was the brilliant hardware engineer and focused on the core design of the computer. And uh, I was worrying about which parts we ought to use and how we were going to build these things and how a, sort of a, somebody that wasn't a Waz was going to manage to buy all the extra parts you still needed to buy and plug this thing together. So I was, I was not designing a computer with any idea we'd ever start a company, ever have a product, ever be successful. It was just to go down to the club and show off and to own and use. Steve saw the interest and he started coming up with ideas right away how this thing could be turned into product how it could be marketed. The two Steves, however, knew little about running a business. Their ambitions might have come to nothing had they not gone to Mike Markula for help. Markula was a retired Intel executive who liked helping young entrepreneurs. When he saw the computer they were building, the Apple, he was entranced. And I looked at it and I said, this is the first affordable, useful, computer for people uh, and the two guys really didn't have the background and experience to to start a company and, and make it successful so I agreed to help them what happened next is the stuff of legend the story of Jobs and Wozniak and the rise of Apple computer is the American dream writ large for the seed the hobbyists had planted grew quickly into a huge microcomputer industry. Contrary to the expectations of the corporate establishment, people did apparently want to own their own computers. 
although it was not clear exactly why. Some used them for games. And later, scientific and business uses were found. But whatever the reason, people apparently wanted to own them. While many of the startup companies folded in this turbulent market, under Markula's careful management, Apple prospered, becoming the fastest growing company in history. Jobs, Wozniak, and Markula became rich beyond their dreams, each ending up with more than $100 million. When Apple went public in 1980, more than 40 Apple employees and investors became instant millionaires. Never before had one company made so many people so rich so quickly. A machine which once cost millions of dollars and filled a room was now coming off the assembly line by the thousands, an idea which a decade before would have sounded like science fiction. IBM, the industry giant, had been sitting on the sidelines watching the fledgling personal computer industry develop. But Big Blue wasn't sure how to respond to this strange new market. And when IBM did make a half-hearted attempt to enter the field, it failed. Much to the amusement of hobbyists like Lee Felsenstein. IBM put out a personal computer in 1975. People don't know this because they don't talk about it very much. The 5100. They call it the portable computer. It would weigh 30 pounds. It was as big as a bread box, had a five inch screen, could cost $5,000 just to open the box and 9,000 if you wanted it to really do anything. They were selling this at the second West Coast Computer Fair, all dressed up in nice little IBM suits, and they weren't doing much business. The guy next door to them, who had a propeller beanie on, a uh, total freak named Lyle Morrow, was doing land office business selling his disks of What's It software, as it was called a little database program. And perhaps they learned something from that. In time, IBM saw the light. While demand for mainframes and mini-computers was still strong, small, inexpensive personal computers were the machines of the future. In 1981, IBM finally introduced a serious machine, and with their superior sales network, soon dominated the industry. Today, a new IBM computer has reached a personal scale. A person can afford it. A person can put it anywhere. Office, home, or school. But despite the astonishing growth of the microcomputer industry, there were problems. Computers were now small and affordable, but they were still infuriatingly difficult to use. If you can't get a computer to do anything but frustrate you. If you're having a hard time understanding computers. What the PC revolution needed had been invented a decade before at Xerox Park software which made a computer easy enough for a child to use. But Xerox had failed to commercialize their great vision. It would be up to someone else to deliver it to the world. That person was Steve Jobs. One day in 1979, he visited the Xerox laboratories and was astonished at what he saw. And it was just instantly obvious to anyone that this was the way things should be. Um, and so I remember coming back to Apple thinking, our, our future has just changed. This is where we have to go. Steve Jobs had seen the light. His challenge was to build a computer which was not only small and affordable, but so intuitive a child could use it. Such a computer might not only change the course of computing, but prevent the mighty IBM from taking over the PC industry. The launch date for his new product, the Macintosh, was January 1984. And in an impassioned speech to his salesman, Jobs couldn't resist invoking the name of George Orwell. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. <laughs> IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. 
Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? In a daring and controversial commercial which attracted the attention of news media all over the world, Jobs created an image of desperate computer users being brainwashed by Big Brother, a veiled reference to IBM. Secure from the pests, obeying constantly. We are one people. But they were about to be awakened from their slumber by the wind of personal interactive computing. January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. The Macintosh marked the beginning of a new era of computing. Gone are the arcane symbols. Instead, using a mouse, a person pushes and pulls pictures using the intuitive skills acquired in childhood. The computer screen, with its pictures and icons, depicts a familiar world even a child can understand. In reality, this friendly graphical illusion is conjured up by thousands of lines of complex code written by computer programmers. This code, in turn, is converted into hundreds of even more basic orders, which this computer knows how to follow. The computer circuits, millions of simple switches, blindly obey opening and closing millions of times a second. If software can transform the look and feel for one computer, then it could, in principle, do it for all computers, even the unfriendly ones. So if I want to copy a file, for instance, I have to know what the meaning of a colon backslash this, that, and the other thing is. And if I mistype a single character, then it will give me some sort of obscure error message. Here I got one that says, not ready error, reading drive A, abort, retry, fail. It's kind of cryptic, and it's certainly not very friendly. It's a typical old-style interface. The interesting thing is that simply by changing the software, not the hardware, exact same hardware, uh, an environment can be built that is much simpler, much friendlier, uh, much more graphical. And I'm going to bring that up right now. We'll take a look at it. I have a pointer that I can move around on the screen. I've got a mouse here. I can click on that to make things happen. The same exact machine, but given different software, it creates an entirely different style of, of interacting with it. The paradox was that to make a computer easier to use, you needed a more powerful computer in the first place because you were going to burn a lot of the cycles on making it easy to use. And so this computer that was easy to use was actually more powerful and could do more things. Powerful computers which once filled a room and cost a small fortune now fit on a desk. Once the exclusive tool of skilled programmers, computers were increasingly simple to use. Now, it was up to individuals to decide what to use them for. Computers could still be used for arithmetic, but different software could transform the same computer hardware into a drawing machine. Simple commands could scale, rotate, or color a drawing, producing in seconds what would have taken a skilled draftsman hours of work. Other software in the same machine turned it into a musician's studio. Or a flight simulator. The uses of a universal machine are bound only by the imagination of the users. Who now stretched all the way from scientists creating the future to classical scholars seeking better ways of searching and analyzing the literature of the past. As the 80s wore on, 
the machine invented to compute numbers was now seen less and less as having anything to do with arithmetic. We call them computers because historically we just happened to use them first for numbers. They could have been used first for controlling moving signs like, uh, like uh, baseball scoreboards in which case we wouldn't have thought of them as numerical, we would have thought of them as textual and graphical machines first and then recognized their numerical functions afterward. So it's a historical accident that they're called computers and this has misled a lot of people. What they really are is all-purpose machines that can be turned to any purpose by instructing them, which doesn't mean uh, saying, now computer, you do this, it means thinking of a series of operations and a way of specifying those operations that will make the events occur that you want to occur. And that sounds so simple. Far from being simple, the elaborate code, the set of arcane software spells and incantations which make a computer add numbers, paint pictures, or make music, is very hard to write. For the few geniuses who knew how to write it, fame and fortune were waiting. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the software dating game. This spoof on the dating game gave an indication of the importance jobs attached to software. He knew people like these three young software geniuses had the power to make or break a company like Apple. He needed a date with all of them. Software CEOs, could I please ask you to introduce yourselves? Hi, Fred Gibbons, president of Software Publishing Corporation. Hi, I'm Mitch Kapor, president of Lotus. We do a product called 123. Mitch Kapor's Lotus 123 spread like wildfire in the business community. In the 1980s, millions were sold. He became a multimillionaire, leaving the company in 1986. My name is Bill Gates. I'm chairman of Microsoft. Bill Gates and had started programming many computers as a kid. After dropping out of Harvard in his freshman year, he went on to form a company called Microsoft, which went from strength to strength. What had begun as a personal enthusiasm for writing programs now developed into a new business with unforeseen dimensions. Still only in his mid-30s, Bill Gates is worth billions. His company in Seattle, Microsoft, employs nearly 10,000 people, many of whom have found fortune in this strange new profession. But unlike Steve Jobs, Bill Gates doesn't make anything tangible. His wealth is based on something rather hard to see. Despite having an annual revenue of more than one and a half billion dollars, the only physical evidence that he produces anything are the pieces of magnetic plastic, floppy disks, and the manuals and boxes in which he sells his product. What Gates is selling is codified thought. The founders of this new industry have noticed some important differences between building in physical media like concrete and building edifices of code. It's different in that we take on novel tasks every time. It's not like building a certain bridge that is virtually identical to some previous bridge or some previous building. And the number of times those people make mistakes is very small. And you know, first you think, well, well what's wrong with us? Uh, it's because it's like we're building the first skyscraper every time, or the first you know, Verrazano uh, bridge. One of the hardest things for programmers to do is write code perfectly the first time. The mistakes they often make are called bugs. Besides giving programmers bad dreams, Bugs have caused late releases and product recalls costing billions of dollars. All right, um, where are we and uh, where do we got to be? Uh, we're in a very good place. Um, the number of must-fix bugs is down to about two a day. I feel good that in two weeks it will be down to, oh, so close to zero no one will care. Chris Peters, one of Microsoft's software supremos, has called his programming team together to discuss the final days of work on their latest software product, a financial spreadsheet. The program that, that we're all working on now is 500,000 lines long, and uh, there's no room for error. 
because there is no reality behind it, you just you're just typing it. The complexity can be machines that like no human has ever seen before. Um, I I believe that 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 these things are like the project I'm working on now is far more complex than a 747 is. A few miles away at the Boeing factory, engineers turn out hundreds of planes each year. A 747 has six million parts, which have to be put together correctly. But at least when something goes wrong, you have a good chance of finding it. With physical things like airplanes and buildings, if there is a fault, you look to see if the problem is nearby. So if you've got something that's not holding its weight well, you look to see if the joint is tight, if the screws are right, if they're... And you don't have to go and analyze the whole building. Well, software doesn't work like that. If you see a problem when you attempt to execute a certain command, there is no simple and direct way of knowing which part of the code could have the problem. In some sense, it could be almost anywhere. And so the detective problem of hunting down the, the source of the problem is enormously harder than in physical media because digital media don't obey the same simplifying law of proximity of cause and effect. Laura, a child of a new computer era, is blissfully unaware of how a computer works and how it is programmed. Born the year of the Mac, she found the objects in her world included not only pets, people, and toys, but friendly computers. Her father took this extraordinary film when she was only 18 months old. Although she can't talk properly and cannot begin to read, she is essentially computer literate. Laura? Let's make a ball. There's the ball. Uh, uh, we're making very nice. Want to make a white ball? The computer, the once the specialized tool of scientists, good. is becoming oh, part of the culture of the young. What is a computer? If someone knows nothing about it, what would you tell them a computer is? What would you say, Kim? Well, a computer is something that you write on and, and press buttons on. All right, so it's something that you can write with. What else can we do with computers? Make designs. How do we make designs on the computer? Well, you press some buttons and then you can make a design. It's something that, like a TV and you could make Look at this. Pictures with it, and it helps you to read. For a new generation of children, the computer was a familiar object in their world. And not knowing anything of its history as a room-sized number cruncher, they had formed their own image of what it was for. How it worked was of no interest to them. What mattered was what they could do with it. Since they used computers for things like drawing, writing, and reading, they saw it as more like a pencil and paper than a machine. For these children, the computer isn't just a new means of expression, it's the only one. These children who are physically and learning disabled have one thing in common. The traditional medium for representing ideas, the book, is largely unavailable to them. Print materials are like stairs. Print materials are inaccessible to a lot of kids. Kids who can't turn pages, can't hold a book. Kids with dyslexia who can't read words. Kids who can't hold a pencil or who can't spell or whose handwriting is very poor. If print materials are like stairs, then the computer can be thought of as a mental ramp, which gives children access to a world of ideas from which they have been excluded. And these are your choices. That reads it. Matthew Huggins is a very intelligent seven-year-old. Because he was born with cerebral palsy, he is unable to control most of his muscles unable to open a book or turn its pages, unable to speak his thoughts and ideas. 
His keen intelligence is trapped inside an unresponsive body. I know, I know what you're doing. You're finding out if, you went, if they went on TWA, right? Am I right? Yes, I thought so. A few years ago, Matthew would have been sent to a special school. But by taking advantage of the computer's remarkable versatility, he is able to attend a public school with other kids his age. The same books other children open and turn can be scanned into a computer where he can control the page turns with his chin. When you have someone like Matthew, who essentially his motor system is not going to work. He can't be an athlete, but he could be an architect, a musician, and the computer has become something that really can offer almost anything to anyone. I would want to be a captain in the army, especially to fly a copter or a plane with my gauge. And I would give pizza to my men, and I would change the course of the world. A remarkable thing has happened. Children of Matthew's generation have worked out what most computer users were unable to see. The computer isn't really a machine at all, but a new medium. It shows signs of becoming as important to our developing culture as the book before it. But the process of acceptance, which took the book hundreds of years, has some way to go. Computers are still very valuable and cherished objects. As with the priceless books of past ages, university libraries chain them in to prevent them from being stolen. If chained libraries gave way to paperback books, what will the computer of the future be like? Computer manufacturers are not hesitant in coming forward with their visions. Most see a world where computers are much smaller and more powerful, where we interact with them by speech. Let's see noise test three again. Okay, change the nozzle dimensions to the ones in noise test three. A world where computers are completely taken for granted. The cracks and the ooze crust and the cracks are called fissures. I knew that. What's it really look like? This is what a volcanic eruption looks like in real life. But others see grander opportunities still. For computers can do many things that books can't. Computers can conjure up powerful visual illusions. These illusions don't have to be confined to a flat, two-dimensional screen. In 1965, the pioneer of computer graphics, Ivan Sutherland, realized computers held the key to a much richer kind of visualization. He wondered what it would be like to reach through the screen itself and surround himself in a simulated world. This experimental helmet gave the user the illusion of being inside a three-dimensional world as he moved his head, so the pictures changed accordingly. The technology was barely able to handle a simple geometrical world in those days, but 25 years later at the University of North Carolina, a group of scientists inspired by Sutherland's idea have brought this art to a level where it can be demonstrated. This is a head-mounted display which consists of a pair of small TV displays connected to a helmet and a small tracking system, which allows the computer to determine where the helmet is in position and orientation at every instant. And using these two technologies, we can program computers to give the feeling to the user who's wearing this of being immersed in the computer-simulated environment. 
So instead of looking at the computer-generated image on a standard TV set on a tabletop, we're inside that world. And instead of walking through the world by knobs and buttons and rotators, we're able to just walk through the world by looking around. And so this particular application is one in which we are walking around a um, church edition that was being planned here a couple of years ago. And here we are telling the computer where we're moving by walking on a treadmill and by steering a pair of handlebars here for the direction. So as you can see, we're coming up in the entrance of this hall and we're turning to the right slightly. And the effect is so powerful because you are doing those actions which are intuitive for you all your life. This looks very nice. I think I want to go into the hall itself. I can look around in here also. I'll look up at uh, the pattern of lights on the ceiling. I like these nice circular windows on each end. Two years before this building was completed, people had walked through it. They had looked at its columns. They had walked inside it and gazed at its windows. Virtual worlds can be about real things like buildings, but they can also help us to visualize and understand worlds we've never seen. And over on the right is a small molecule called methotrexate, which is one of the inhibitors for this molecule, so that I can move it in space. I can bring it over near the enzyme, and also I can turn and twist it, and I can walk it inside this cavity. Now I let it go inside the cavity, and all of the things show colors. I can go in and stick my head right in the middle of it. I'm back in the active site now. And you can go right through and come out the other side. It feels a little strange. Of course, you don't feel the molecule. You don't actually bump into it. But it seems that way. That we wanted a room-filling molecule. Why? Because it's hard to navigate your way around a big protein. And if you put the C terminus down in this corner of the room, and you put the N terminus over in that corner of the room, and you know the room, well, you can find your way around in the molecule. It, it, it takes on a, a reality of space that lets your kinesthetic memory help you navigate in it. With virtual worlds, we can experience people's thoughts. We see them, we walk through them, and in the future, touch feedback will enable us to feel thoughts as well. See, I'm walking right in space. <laughs> you see, I'm looking down right on top of uh, <laughs> this right now. Yes. At the moment, the illusions strain the limits of what computer hardware can manage. Every time the user moves, millions of computations have to be done to update the image. This is why it is still a little jerky. But things are improving very quickly. We're just barely at the point where we can do interesting demonstrations. I see no end to the process of faster and faster computers, and I see no end to what we can do to use that power if we have it in virtual world modeling. I think that the switch from 2D to 3D is tremendously exciting because in one sense, 2D is what we have been doing with intellectual activities for centuries. It is what we write, it is what we read, it is the pictures that we see on the walls, it is the way we communicate with people. On the other hand, 3D is where we live all the time. Our everyday life is three-dimensional. And so I believe that as soon as the computers become capable 
of being able to interact with the users in three dimensions, that the more natural interface will be a 3D one. Funding is made possible by Unisys, meeting the mission-critical information systems needs of business and government worldwide. At Unisys, we make it happen. And by the 90,000 members of the ACM, computer professionals advancing human capabilities through information technology. And the National Science Foundation.